John Leonard, so pleased to be, so we could take this time to actually get connected. I'm super excited to be able to hear your story. Um, a little bit about, you know, what's happening here in Bali right now, what's happening globally right now. I'd also love to hear a little bit about what you're doing with Wanaprasta, which of course is Sanskrit for back to nature, right? Yeah, return to nature. Return to nature, okay. And that totally sums up what you're doing. So definitely want to hear about what's happening there with the business, with the ethical raising of animals and, and the really natural way of getting food, right, and producing food for, for humans. So excited to hear about that. Also would love to hear a bit about your background because I know you've got an extraordinary story. You're married to a beautiful Filipino woman and you just had a little boy, so congratulations on that. Um, so we'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, where, where and you know, obviously a background in agriculture in Australia as well before that. So there's been this real, you know, interesting story that we'd love to hear about. But John, so grateful. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your time and glad we could take this time to, um, to get together. So probably the best place to start would be just a little bit about you. About, I mean, tell us, who, who is this extraordinary man that I, that I get to sit before? Uh, Look, the, main, the most important thing for me is to support farmers, so okay. that's what I do. I, I'm particularly interested in supporting farmers in the third world, the mm -hmm. first world farmers generally doing quite well, um, uh, but third world farmers are pretty much suppressed in, in terms of any hope of, of lifting themselves out of poverty. Mm. So I guess uh, my role is to sponsor farmers um, to lift themselves out of poverty. Wow. But. I, I guess I teach them how to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I give them pathways to follow. The only requirement for me to do that is that they convert their thinking into earth love. Wow. I want them to farm with earth love foremost in their mind so that uh, they're getting their, their hands in that soil, dirty mm. with that soil, uh, smelling that soil, and, and really getting back to a relationship with nature. That That's the one rule I set. Yeah, wow. So to be part of a cooperative uh, means you have to develop that mindset. Yeah. And that's what we do. And, and it's, it's growing. I mean, I've had, uh, I've got PNG now wanting me to um, fly over there and, and start uh, the revolution. Papua, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea. Yeah, wow. Um, uh, a little bit of uh, interest in the Philippines as well. But the, mm -hmm. the revolution is really about uh, teaching farmers uh, how to be leaders with the environment wow. because if, 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 if we can get them back on, 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 on board uh, the earth will take some huge leaps forward in terms of uh, protecting itself because farmers will be on the front line of yeah, saying wow. no we won't do that um, and yes we will do this. Yeah we're not going to do this to the land this is mm. how we mm. are going to treat mm. it. Mm. Wow and I get I mean you've got a special connection with the earth and a special love for the earth it's you know been challenging and inspiring for me since we met you know, well over a year ago and I started to hear about you know your whole philosophy and approach and how you kind of spiritual. look spiritual it's a spiritual thing well, tell us more um, about that well for me I think um, God is in every living thing and uh, I, I think when you learn to respect that and learn to respect uh, God's diversity mm. and God's complexity and stop simplifying it and, and just accept that this is the energy of God everywhere around us. So, you know, humans, we, we, we bring these suitcases full of all these snake oils and little tricks <laughs> and magic tricks and throw it out there and, and we can force nature to change and do this and do it in this way and do it in this many. And, and we, 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 our little bags of magic tricks work for a short period of time. Sure. But it, it removes God from the equation and it sickens the earth gotcha. and it starts it, it, it doesn't sicken in it like this automatic sudden way it can but it, it generally it's just a, a long-term il illness mm. and that long-term illness is catching up with us mm. so we're about saying stop bringing the boxes of magic tricks what, what, what kind of things are the, are the magic tricks what are oh, you talking you, about? You, we really we're talking about the chemicalization yeah. of, of farming of, of nature 
So monoculture oh. crops, GMO. Well, they only exist through through chemicalisation. Gotcha. I mean, even GMO develops because of chemicalisation because they want the chemicals to work only with certain plants. Right. Um, they, there is no, there is absolute resistance to any kind of engagement with nature, and that's mm. kind of like saying, I don't want to engage with God mm. at all. Well, we you can do that. Sure. But this 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 God that we live on will die yeah, right. and it's going to take us with it of course mm. of course I'm excited to hear you know Elon Musk and others exploring space and colonizing Mars and all this kind of stuff it's not it's, it's not, not what even, you're excited about it's not even <laughs> going to matter because if we destroy this planet and we find another one what are we going to do to the next one <laughs> Touche. It, it's going to be the same yeah. thing so unless we can get it right here and get our mentality right here what's the point what's the point we're just taking the, the mistakes we've made here to another yeah. world gotcha and then well, then we have avatar yeah you know, the film avatar all yeah. over again yeah you know? so i i know you know when we watch the movie avatar there's very few people sort of rooting for the marines yeah sure you know, rooting for those mining for the miners. machines you know? yeah everyone's rooting for who, who's connected with God? Who's connected yeah. with with this? The, you know the the the, the planet energy. Mm. So mm. you know that, that's who humans deep down. That's who humans really want to be. Yeah. They really want to have that relationship, mm. which is why we create so many pictures of who God is. Sure. We want that relationship. Yeah. So how how did you get to that? Tell me a bit about your story and your background, and, and kind of bring us through the through the big chunks to bring us up to today and, and the work that you're doing. And I'll let you kind of just go for it because it's, it's a remarkable story. It, it comes from trauma. I, I don't know if I can talk about this in too much detail, but I... As much I, as you're comfortable I, to. I came, I was on my farm and, and was struggling with uh, my wife um, uh, and children um, were with another man and, and had left me and, I, and my wife wouldn't let me see my children mm. um, and I was uh, farming on my, on my farm alone and, and I was looking at suicide. Uh, I was battling it every single night. It was really difficult and I was extremely lonely. Um, I thought my world was over. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very lucky. I had a, a friend who grabbed me and, and uh, flew me to India to shake me up. Wow. And, and we traveled around India on these old motorcycles and, and, and just with a cricket ball and we'd turn up at a village throwing the cricket ball up and down and we'd have kids come from everywhere and you'd make friendships and, and, and you'd have a game of cricket where of course you would lose. <laughs> and, and, but it... it, it, it reawakened a love inside me mm. and that love that I poured into my family and my children um, that had died that had, had been taken away from me uh, it, it was reawakened in India but it was it's, it's, it was more of a it, it wasn't a selfish love it was a love uh, an admiration for the beauty of the planet mm. and, and I'll tell you what triggered it what triggered it was something quite tragic I think really sad I, I was on the motorbike and I was stopped in traffic and I was okay. under this big arch in, in Rajasthan, in a city in Rajasthan. And uh, I looked, uh, caught in traffic on the motorbike, yep. I looked to my left and I remember I saw some little tiny shits and I thought they were little animal shits. So okay. in my subconscious, uh, what, I, what I'd be doing on my farm is trying to work out what animal belonged to those shits. Sure. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm looking at these little turds and I, I didn't actually look here. I knew there were people here. But I, I followed the line of shits until they got to two little boys oh. who were on the side of the road. And they were either unconscious, I didn't know, they had distended stomachs, they were extremely skinny. They were obviously dying. And I looked quickly back at the shit and I realized it was their shits and they had got smaller and smaller and smaller. And the shits that they're down this end were covered in, in dust, so they were old. So maybe they were shitting once a week, once a month, I don't know. But just in that moment when I registered them and I looked at them, the traffic moved and I moved on with the traffic. But I can tell you that image, and even today, that image is like a photograph. Wow. And it's that photograph that reminds me that I have this journey in my life that I can't waste it. 
Mm. I, I, I have to do something valuable and important with my life. Mm. And the moment I start to lose track of that, I think of those two little, mm. I don't know if they were girls or boys, but, but clinging together and, and that was their journey. Um, look, that image reminds me that oh. I, I have to take responsibility for, for this planet and the, and the love that we that we should have for this world, for this wow. planet. Yeah. So that triggered a real explosion of activity in me, and I came back and went back out to the farm. Yep. I was doing some fencing, and I kept hearing my kids calling me in the forest behind me, and I'm doing this fencing, <laughs> and I kept hearing them calling me, and I could feel the the depression, the darkness coming back, and I just walked away. Walked, uh, took a took a walk to the airport and, and flew out, and wow. the journey has continued from that point. And I basically said, I'm going to keep travelling until I found find a, a purpose, until wow. I find somewhere where I'm doing something. I, I I didn't worry about my I didn't have a lot of money. I just walked off the off the farm. I threw the keys at my neighbour and said, you know, you can use the farm for whatever you want. Um, and, and yeah, I, uh, within uh, a couple of weeks, I was I was in other tra traveling through other cultures and other worlds, and wow. yeah, that's 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 what happened. That's how I got to where I am now, and I ended up uh, spending more time here because I, I bunkered down and started supporting and and, and guiding uh, farmers who were interested in changing their relationship with the land. So how long ago was that that you walked away from? I mean, that's a, a massive... <sighs> how yeah. long ago was that? Um, I see, I, for me, 2008 was, I died in 2008. I believe I was a living dead. Wow. Uh, I had a few people who wouldn't hear from me for ages um, um, would be coming, would come to the farm to make sure I was still kicking or... or, or uh, but it was in that last period where I'd gone a couple of weeks, and my closest friend, I hadn't, I hadn't picked up the phone, and I was pretty much in a dark place. That's when he just pulled out all the stops and drove out five hours driving, wow. uh, pick, uh, grabbed me by the scruff, dragged me out of my my because uh, I was just sleeping all the time, and, and it took me to India. And so uh, I, that was in 2008. Yep. Um, and so the journey for me about pulling it all together was 2008 was uh, uh, my, my death of the old me yeah. and to, so from 2009 was the rebirth of, of uh, a more responsible earth w uh, warrior if you mm. want to call it that. So then of course uh, I didn't come straight to Bali. No. Was Philippines well, next? Or? No, I came to Bali first because okay. I had some dreams about some places, some, uh, and and I, so I came here, mm -hmm. um, and nothing amazing happened. And okay. So I was very disappointed, <laughs> but that was okay because I had uh, tickets to fly through about seven, eight countries at that time. Wow. So I was just looking. I didn't know where the answers were, or if there were any answers. Sure. What frightened me is if there were no answers, then it meant flying back to the farm and. Wow. And all the memories and, and the things would come creeping up on me again. So I knew that was something to avoid at all sure. costs. Um, so, mm. yeah, I, I, um, I, I came to Bali, nothing amazing happened. So, and I, I found the, the Kuta part of Bali quite okay. ugly, um, like the cancer. Uh, I, I, but I came up here um, expecting something amazing. The only amazing thing was I did fall in love with uh, the, the, the religion and the relationship okay. they have in the religion, that, that very ancient teaching uh, that carries uh, teaching about our, how our relationship with nature should be. That really mm. struck a chord with me. Nice. But yeah, then I, I moved on to the next stop, which was um, um, living in slums. I really wanted to touch bottom. Wow. So I went and lived in a couple of slums in Manila. That's how I started. Uh, that was quite frightening, uh, but uh, invigorating. I mean, you're watching people dying of TB around you, and you're sort of trying to hold your breath. <laughs> oh, I don't want to breathe any of that. But, but when you're seeing people die from really basic things around you, and the, 
Like you, you, you a slum is, uh, look, the only way I could possibly have done that is because I was a baby being reborn and yeah, wow. having to rebuild who I was. Yeah, wow. So uh, I, I look back on living in that slum and think, how the hell did I do that? Sure. I, I, can't, I couldn't do it now, I don't think. But at that stage I was at, of rebirth, of relearning life, mm. I, I didn't, didn't worry me at all. Wow. And, and so I got caught up in thing. I traveled to uh, one of the outer islands that has uh, issues of separatism and danger. And actually you're told not to go there by your government. Uh, they don't, your, your insurance. Um, it doesn't cover you if you go oh, there. Wow. Things like that. So of course, that's the, the place oh, you're I going didn't straight care. there. Oh, I didn't <laughs> care. I wanted to be on the edge. I wanted to suck life yep. back up into my spirit and, and, wow. and keep that rebirth going. So I, I went and lived there. And, and um, I, I don't know if I can talk about some of the things that, but. but um, I, I started doing uh, forestry. Um, it's more about, I traveled through a couple of regions that, that some uh, Chinese forestry companies had bought the valleys. We're talking gigantic mm -hmm. valleys. Okay. And they had just stripped every living tree plant. The, the, the mountains were bare. They were just destroying oh. everything. And it shocked me. It shocked me. Uh, the contrast. This is virgin forest, yeah. right? We're not yeah, talking yeah, yeah, plantation. Yeah. We're, talking, we're talking virgin, virgin. It's never had anything. Wow. And, and uh, when you're seeing the, the rivers washing the soil and everything's like a golden brown color washing out the sea, and when you know what's happening environmentally, it, it's, it's, it's frightening. But what struck me even more than that was all the little children, because you being the white guy who most of them had never seen before, Sure. Um, would come gathering around and, and, and smiling and, and wanting to touch you and stuff and, so they want to, and wanting to touch you. Um, they would smile and their t teeth were all rotten. Mm. There were black stumps and it struck me because the next few valleys where there was not this development that was still virgin, the tribal people that lived there, when the kids came running around you and smiled, it was just this perfect beaming teeth huh. and that's what slapped me in the face it made me just look at the contrast between this is civilization and this is what's happening to the people and this is nature and these people have relationships with nature in harmony with nature and the children's health they look yeah, awesome wow. and so then I, I, huh. I, I got involved in the forestry in those areas to teach the people how to do sustainable forestry, don't allow roads to be built, um, do forestry by getting their carabao to, to go into the mountains and, and selectively clear um, the high value trees sure. and bring them out and, and, and uh, start a little nursery and make seedlings so that every time they took a tree they would plant five seedlings of that wow. tree so that this would be forestry that would be sustainable for their people, for their tribe, for thousands of years into yeah. the future. And when everyone else's land is degraded and destroyed, these people will still have nature close to them. Mm. And so I got involved in that. Wow. And, and um, I, I, I guess that's where I, I, I started to find myself again too. Yeah, wow. It's working I mean, in that way massive purpose in that yeah and I'm, I still have a very actually my son's middle name is named after the tribal people there because I still very, feel very connected mm. to them um, they in so many ways in terms of the outside world they don't know and understand and they're they're actually made to feel a little bit ashamed when they speak their language to, to be made to feel that oh you're primitive and I'm sure this sort of thing goes on in the Amazon and, and sure. Brazil and places like that where, where the, the people that live more with nature are actually made to feel like they're the primitive ones. Mm. But when you look at it from an ecological point of view, there's only one primitive um, participant, it's not them. Yeah, mm. yeah I definitely agree. Well, it's Avatar all over again. It's, it's well, such yeah, a yeah, yeah. they've got all the machinery and all the fancy stuff and all the mm. medicines and these people just have a relationship with nature. But mm. at the end of the day, that relationship with nature is, would go f could last a billion years. Mm. 
but the system we've erected that we call <laughs> civilized hasn't even hasn't even managed the last hundred years too well. Mm. So mm. you know, you've got to you got to ask that question, I guess. So then I, I came back to Bali, um, mostly because there were unanswered questions here, there were spiritual okay. questions I had here, and also because um, um, things got quite difficult. Um, uh, gold got discovered, um, oh. and the whole region turned into something like, uh, have you seen the series Deadwood? <laughs> it's a, it's like a gold rush place where life is cheap and things got extremely dangerous and wow. um, it, I kind of stood out a little bit as, sure. a, as a white guy and it, uh, um, I pretty much had to had to move on. So right. yeah, wow. So I closed the door to that chapter. Yeah, of course. I mean that that changes things when all of a sudden the most valuable thing isn't isn't the timber; it becomes in the earth and. Um, Again, crazy because that gold's been there for all that time, and the, the local people don't. I mean, they know it's there, but they don't. What, what, what use do they have for that, right? The, well, they didn't Did they, even know. They're, actually, a lot of the what started to come up was was ancient gold jewelry started to be oh. started to be unearthed. A lot of it, um, and I started posting pictures to to some. Uh, Groups made up of a lot of professors that specialise in, in, in uh, artifa ancient artefacts. There's a lot of um, Chinese ceramics, huh. uh, a lot of uh, really uh, primitive gold jewellery, beautiful. In uh, initially, the tribes people were bringing it to me and saying, This is Japanese treasure. And I was looking at it, and you can see all the stones that are mounted in the jewellery were all uncut. So it wasn't recent stuff. I could see it was sure. old, old stuff. So then it was just a matter of posting it and getting these experts around the world to tell me what I was looking at and what mm -hmm. it was. Um, and so it was uh, from 900 AD era, a lot of the wow. stuff. Yeah, so more than a thousand years. And, and that's what made me realize the, the, the native people there have a heritage of, of, of uh, of civilization uh, that, mm. that uh, had been lost. Mm. And so I started to look at where and why it had been lost and uh, the answer basically came to conquistadors traveling on ships across from Peru. Oh wow. It's one of the reasons the Philippines was taken by Spain is because there was this little hidden genocide that went on on these islands where gold was found. Wow. Because the conquistadors could come and swap one silver ball for four gold balls. Huh. That's what I read in the Jesuit accounts. And so they basically went crazy, killed the people trying to force them to hand over their gold. And it was just depopulated the whole wow. island and every, nature came back, grew over everything, and it all got forgotten. So huh. a whole civilization existed there. And the interesting thing for me is that civilization was, uh, was Sanskrit, was Hindu Buddhist. It's very wow. similar to Balinese. So that triggered the connection for me so oh. that even the tribal people there, if they listen to, to priests speaking in, in, the, in the priestly language here, they can follow it wow. because their languages are very, very similar. Wow. Yeah, it was really interesting. And I got the connection. And that's, that's the reason I came back to Bali is because I wanted to write about my experiences. I wanted to write about what mm. had happened. I wanted to write about my rebirth. Mm. And I thought the best place to be if I want to see, I, I mean, how their civilization was before I need to come to Bali and see how it, is. How it was mm. and, and before it was all annihilated and destroyed and there's wow. a bit of an analogy there in terms of what humans are doing to the planet because we've, we've evolved this civilization the only way we're going to survive is it won't be in this format because this format we have now is 100% killing the planet mm. so it's almost going to be a, a, a kind of Planet of the Apes, Apes scenario, or okay. if, if you want a darker example, or, or it's, it's going to be a, a different world completely to the one that we've created now. Mm. And, and that's the way we're going to keep humans on this planet, but we're going to have to change everything dramatically. And, and so all that's going to be buried, and the way humans will live in the future will only be able to do archaeological research on how we lived before, and they'll be astounded. They will what, be astounded. What were they thinking? Yeah, they'll be astounded. <laughs> They'll probably be thinking, 
how the hell did we survive? Yeah. How did, how did we get Shit, through boy. this 200 year nightmare period? Yeah. And uh, that's coming, that's a definite. Wow. That's a definite. So what do you see as, I mean, when we consider, you know, all agricultural revolution, now the industrial revolution, we've got oil, we've got well, skyscrapers and super tankers. You missed and one there. You, you missed the one that never gets talked about. You, that people go that, you know, the, the, the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution. The one that came after that, that people don't talk about is the chemical revolution. Okay. So I just wrote an article about this recently where we're just at the point where we discovered that that soil there is thriving with billions upon one spoon has a billion upon a billion upon a billion living organisms wow. in it. Yep. Humans are not the apex animal. Sure. These guys are. Mm. If humans are wiped out, the world keeps going. Yeah. If, if these guys are wiped out, the world stops. Everything stops. Beca becomes a rock landscape like Mars. Wow. So, so just around the same time that we discovered that level of importance in the soil, we've gone, how do we control it? Huh. How do we manipulate it? And so the chemical era, the chemical revolution, you could say the chemical revolution after the First World War was where yeah. we really started messing with chemicals, mostly from the point of view of what chemicals can do to human beings mm. with, with the gas and various other things. Sure. But the 20s, 30s was the development of, of chemistry as, as a major uh, direction to be following. And so from the 40s, 50s, 60s, it's, the world was chemicalized in ways mm. we don't even really understand wow. because we don't have a clear analysis of mm. that chemicalization. And so almost all the food we eat today is a result of that chemicalization. Yeah. Um, the, the, the issues that come out of that chemicalization are not debated enough, are not yeah, discussed sure. enough. But there is a movement now. People are starting to, to want to turn their backs Mm. on that chemical isolation. Tell, tell me, what is that, well, I mean, we talk about chemical farming and we talk about spraying f um, herbicides and pesticides and, and insecticides and fungicides and all this kind of different stuff. What, what's all that made out of? Where's it all come from? What, what are we actually talking about here? We're talking about the bag of tricks I spoke about before. Yeah, sure. We're, we're talking about things that, like, I mean, we've got a billion years, nature's balance, we've got a billion years of understanding how it all works and it's all mm. networked, it's all connected. Mm. So you damage or remove it from here, it's going to have a ripple effect through mm. nature and it's had a billion years to get that balance right mm. and we're just occupying that balance, that, that, that wire, we're occupying it. We, we didn't make it, Sure. our existence uh, uh, is a result of it, yep. but then what we do is that we now say that we, we're going to invent these things that have no track record, haven't been tested over a billion years, maybe tested in a lab over 12 months if you're lucky, and those things we're going to throw in, onto that wire because we want to be able to hop and skip and jump a little bit more or make more money. Yeah. We're messing with a balance that has taken a billion years. And our bag of tricks, we're, th we're saying that our bag of tricks is equal to a billion years of balancing. Mm. I say it isn't, and a lot of people will say it isn't. Mm. All of these sorts of things that we're doing um, are just pure gambles, mm. complete and utter gambles. And sometimes we get it wrong in really graphic ways. Sure. Like if you want to talk Fukushima, you, you want to talk, uh, what's the other one in Ukraine, you want to talk mm. about those sorts of events are results of humans taking risks mm. that they have no control over the, the consequences. The oil spills, the landfill, the, the toxicity goes, it, it of the just ocean. It goes on and on, the plastic yeah. in the ocean. The, the, uh, yeah, it just goes on. We could just sit here all day and talk about the <laughs> About the problems. Yeah. And there's plenty of people doing that. Yeah. There are plenty of people really focused at a yeah. lot of the big issues. And there's some major issues facing humanity and the planet. Some of us, I guess, are saying don't bring your bag of tricks here anymore. We don't want, them. we want yeah. to rest our faith in a billion years of balance. That's where we want to have our mm. faith. And if it means uh, I die younger or quicker or whatever because of that, that I'm not meant to live forever. Um, but I'm in a system that's so perfectly balanced, it's beautiful. Mm. Please keep your bag of tricks. Mm. 
uh, to yourself. The, 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 uh, I mean, the world is dividing into these two groups, bag of trick tricksters and, and nature uh, responders or nature warriors, what I would mm. call nature warriors. Right on. So the bag of tricks, the chemical stuff, is that, I mean, what do they make? Is it made of oil? Is it from plastic? Is it, I mean, no, they say it, synthetic, it, which it, is man-made, but what, it, it I mean, we've got, we're in a closed loop system on this planet, right? We've only got what's here. What are they, what are they actually making the chemicals out of? This is a personal curiosity. I just, the, the chemicals can, can come from the natural world as well, yeah. but they're able to refine and focus and regenerate it in ways that, that make it a thousand times, a billion times more powerful than it was meant to be in nature. Mm, gotcha. That balance is no longer a consideration because I want to create this element. So to create this element, I need to control these things yeah. and create this. And then I look at what this thing can do for me. And right. sometimes this thing can do wonderful things, but sometimes uh, it, it's a double payment. There's going yeah, to be a sure. cost for sure. it. So it does come from this finite world, but uh, we focus, we concentrate, yeah, we, gotcha. we break things down and attach them to other things uh, in, in ways that weren't meant to be. Yeah. Or this world didn't want it to evolve like that, and there was obviously a reason. A billion years of getting things in balance, you've got to respect that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I hear that. I mean, I'm clearly not a chemist. You can tell by the question. I don't even <coughs> get this, but um, I hear what you're saying about we've, we've been, you know, living, coexisting <coughs> as humans, as animals, with plants, with bacteria, with, you know, wildlife and marine life on this planet for a long, long time. And nature can be challenging, right? It can be difficult, it can be, can be hard sometimes. And, and as humans, we can think we're so clever, we want to control that to make our life easier, more pleasant and safer and you know, get some of our needs for, for certainty and hey, look what we did and aren't we so clever? And we create all that and then you're, what you're looking at is really what's the downside of that mm. and what's the cost of that? And while it might seem nice in the short term to have some of those privileges or benefits, what's, what's the long term expense I think it, I mean it's good to to ha I mean some of those things could have really good positive outcomes but we are so addicted to to any changes or any manipulations or any toys in that in that magic box that we don't spend enough time looking at what the consequences yeah, sure. are we almost don't care <laughs> it's because money's driving it gotcha. so when money's involved you don't really care what the consequences are so long as you've got enough money from, from mm. hmm. All right, so two questions. What if we do and what if we don't? I guess, what, what's, the, what's the likely, on the path that we're on of chemical, chemicalization, what's the only possible, likely, most likely or only possible outcome? And if we spin it around, what's the likely outcome and what could that look like? But we'll come to that one, come to that one next. We're kind of like the mouse on the treadmill. Okay. We, we can't stop. Because once we started this journey, we can't stop. So that, that's why there's, what, 9 billion, 10 billion humans on the planet. It's, it's out of balance. Humans are out of balance. Sure. We are completely out of balance. Uh, a couple of things could happen. Nature is going to bring the pandemic of all pandemics to, to get that. To restore the balance. Get the balance back. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to fight that tooth and nail all the way without realizing that this is about balance. At the end of the day, balance will win. Mm. The balance will, 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 it will find balance. Mm. Because to not find balance is the end of the world. Mm. So uh, I think uh, while humans are on that, that mouse treadmill, um, we're saying, okay, we need more food. You know, we need uh, all these food issues because we've got 9 billion humans. Okay, so we're going to need more food because we project there'll be 15 billion humans. Mm. We're still on that treadmill. We have to just stop that treadmill. Mm. There, there, there does need to be a pandemic. There does need to be adjustments. Mm. And, and uh, more humans is not the answer. That's, that's, the, that's the number one thing. Mm. Um, we, we have to keep, we, 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 I mean, to support the, the oppressive numbers of humans on this planet, um, you, you know where it's taking us. It's taking us to a point where humans will have to cannibalize. That's the, that's the one issue no one will ever talk about. I mean, look at it. Look at it logically. What happens when there isn't enough land, there isn't enough ocean to support the number of humans on the planet? 
what, what's the logical result? Hmm. There's an example actually already in history. Uh, the future. If you read the book, The Future Eaters. Um, Future eaters. He he, uh, he does a study of um, what he, I, I actually found it fascinating to read about what happened in New Zealand, where the, when the Maori arrived in New Zealand, there were massive moa. It was like walking kitchens around everywhere, and the moa couldn't really escape from human human hunting, and so the the human population, the Maori population of New Zealand, went kaboom, huge. And it was easy to feed that population because you just go, there's a mower wandering over here and you've got 180 kilos of, or maybe 400 kilos of, of meat. Wow. And, and with no effort at all, you can bring down that mower and, and feed your family for a week. Yeah. So it was easy. And what they found in the studies, in the archaeological studies, is they found in the, when the Maori first arrived in New Zealand, say for the first 100 years, the mower were killed and the only meat taken from this half, I don't actually know their weight, but it's like 400 kilo animal. No, like, a, I mean like a big, big buffalo or a... Yeah, 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 that would be a good comparison. Okay. The only meat they would take were the two strips of meat that ran, up, ran either side of their neck. Yeah. And so what they found in the first hundred years of human habitation on New Zealand was they, were very, they only took the prime cuts. Yeah. Everything else they left to rot. But then as the mower started, the numbers of mower started. Now this is, this is a, I guess, a, a metaphor or a story that is happening to the world as sure. a planet. But as there were less mower to eat, as there were less mower to hunt, they started to And more Maori eat. to feed. Yeah, and more Maori to feed so because of the population like boom. Yeah. They started to eat the whole animal, huh. which is good. But the trajectory in terms of the population and, and the numbers of mower falling and the numbers of humans rising, it, it meant eventually the mower got wiped out. Yep. And so the Maori are left with very little protein in their diets from other sources. Their main food source is gone. So what ended up happening in the last, say, 100 to 200 years of Maori evolution in New Zealand is they turned to hunting other humans. Wow. And that's why the Maori went from a paradise to this highly organized military structure. It's why the Maori could defend themselves from European invasion. Wow. They, they, they were organized to, because Warriors. They, yeah, to hunt their protein from wow. other, other groups. And so, you know, they say, and in this book, The Future Eaters, they estimate that the, the Maori population was already crashing when the Europeans arrived, mm -hmm. and that they would estimate within 100, 200 years, the Maori population would be almost uh, fallen to nothing. They would have died out. Wow. And they believe this is also what occurred with the East, Easter Islanders, you know, the ones with uh -huh. those funny yeah, heads yeah. that sit up. It, they, they, the argument is the same, that it was, a, the pop, it was such a paradise, the population increased to a point where they just destroyed uh, their food sources and their ability to uh, feed themselves and, uh, and humans cease to exist. It's so crazy for us with all our supposed intelligence to have such a, a history of irresponsibility and a history of lack of foresight. Really, and then you have a look at what's happening in the world today, and go, well, no, we're smart, we're civilized, we're sophisticated, we're doing it all over again. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, we are. Jeez. The the the, the most important <laughs> thing to me is I don't put humans first. I put this planet first. Okay. So if this planet grows, evolves, and moves on in the sort of beauty that it has now, I, I can die happy. Mm. You know, I, I don't want to, I'm not selfish about it at all. I know all things live and all living things die. Hmm. So it's part of the pattern. And accepting life and the contract that comes with life is that death is coming. It, it's okay. a beautiful thing. That's why even death is a beautiful thing, should be a beautiful thing, because it's part of the contract. Hmm. So long as in that first part of the contract, when you had life, you did whatever you could do to be a defender of this living world. Mm. If you use that time to protect this world, to protect this planet, um, then when your death comes, 
you can you can pass on smiling, knowing yeah. that you played a really really important role. Wow. Well, let's have a look at that because if we the goosebumps when you say that that's amazing. When we consider um, when we really consider the future and look at what would it take for humanity to live in a way that truly honors Earth and that is in harmony with, with nature and that is going to be sustainable long term, have you got a vision for how that could, how, we, how could we do that? It's I not cities and suburbs, right? And I super highways well, and supermarkets. It could be. It could okay. still involve those things. I mean, I, I don't have all the answers. I have some sure. answers. I do know that if you put a commitment to the planet first, the planet will show you the answers. Mm. It, will, it will show you what needs to be, what needs to happen. I, 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 I think I, I have to refer to what nature teaches me to, to know what some of the answers are. Mm -hmm. I do know that if you're living uh, a life which is in the concrete jungle, where if you are living in a city, you are living in the suburbs or whatever, you can make choices about what you do every day that will specifically have an impact, and a big one. Okay. And that is by, by choosing what you consume. What you consume has to have the, uh, nature as its priority. So the food you consume, the food you eat, has to come from people who prioritize nature, who prioritize love for the planet. Mm. If, if you're just uh, tap dancing that you love the planet and pretending and creating this marketing program that's at least better than not giving any sort of concern sure but beyond that you want to seek out people that really do put the planet first and they're the people you buy from that's mm. where you funnel all your money mm. everything you can possibly funnel when you've got five people selling things you're going to question all of them and the one you're going to send your money to is based on that person has a commitment to the health of this planet. Mm. When you make those decisions based on that person's commitment to the planet, you're already helping protect this planet mm. in, in so many ways wow. that, that you can't even explain it just in this conversation. Yeah, it will wow. have a ripple effect deep mm. out. Um, I, I, think, I, I think that's something we can all do. Mm. Just ask that question. Oh. What kind of commitment do you have to this world? I mean, even me talking to you, I weighed up. I didn't say this to you before, sorry, but I'm going to say Fine, it to you now. Sure. I weighed up what kind of person you were in terms of your commitment to mm -hmm. this world, to this planet, to mm. the beauty of the God that we live on. Mm. And before I would decide to speak with you, I had to know that you're somebody that cared about this planet. Mm. I, 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 I do it in almost everything I do. Wow. I have to know that you have that level of commitment. Mm. And, and if everybody operated like that, we create almost a mafia of, of ecological warriors, of people that put the planet first. Right on. Um, and it's why, it's, it's why vegans, for example, shouldn't hate meat eaters. Because there are meat eaters who, who ask those same questions that want to ensure that meat comes from sources that are um, uh, legitimately committed to the health of the world, of mm. the planet. There are vegans that are the same, but there are also vegans that don't have those commitments to the health of the planet. Mm. They think by just being vegan, that's enough. It's sure. not. It's not. Because you could still be buying your vegetables, your carpets, your, your refrigerators from people who really don't care. Mm. The only green they love it's the green in money. <laughs> and, and, and so whether you're, you're, you make food choices and you have labels for things, there's a brotherhood out there and the brotherhood d doesn't depend on whether you eat meat or whether you eat vegetables or whether you eat only seafood or whatever it is. Whatever sure. those labels are, it's a brotherhood, it's a sisterhood, it's a commitment of love for the God we live on. Mm. It's, it's a commitment to this world, to this planet. And we're all sisters and brothers in that. Mm. Um, and all those uh, smaller issues fall away mm. while we stay focused on supporting people that support the thing there, that's out there. Yeah. Beautiful. And, yeah, and yeah. we've got to join together. We've got to not let those smaller uh, uh, play around terms yeah. divide us. Yeah. 
You know, we've got to come together and say we're all warriors for this planet. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and if that doesn't happen, we just keep spinning on that on that mouse wheel, and we're not going to be here mm -hmm. for much longer. Humans are on their way out. We need people who stop spinning on that treadmill. Mm -hmm. Get off the treadmill. Mm -hmm. So tell me what, and that's really cool because it gives us some really practical things that anybody can do and they can look at when they go to their supermarket or do they go to their organic farmers or the farmers markets or do they just go to their garden and go, where's my commitment? Where am I getting my sustenance from? What can I do right here where I stand to support people who have that love for the planet? And, and do all of those things yeah. in all the different ways and, and it's, it's about focusing your money, your time, your energy towards people that care about the planet. Yeah, I hear you. So tell me more about what's some of the, really, you know, on a real practical level, what's some of the things that you've been able to do to express your love for the planet with the work that you're doing here and, you know, some of the stuff that's going on right now and the farmers that you're supporting and, you know, what's happening on the ground here in Bali as a, you know, it really is an outpouring or as an expression of that, this, this beautiful love that you have for this this earth that we live on? My role is more, uh, it's motivation and okay. keeping people focused on, on, on the goal because you can lose your way. In, in, the, in the fight for money, in the fight for lifestyle, in the fight for, you can lose your way and forget what, what the focus should be. Mm. And so that's my role. I, I, I think it's a very small thing, uh, but I am able to pull people together. Um, I do show people I guess particularly because a lot of the farmers here are poor mm -hmm. and I do focus on the poor farmers okay. um, mostly because they're so poor that they haven't chemicalized and damaged their soils already Okay. so they're easy they to work with. couldn't afford the chemicals? Yeah. So the, yeah. the earth's still good? Yeah. Huh. yeah. They don't know they're sitting on gold. They don't know they're sitting on something really beautiful that hasn't been damaged. Yeah, and so right. I go in there and say, tell them, you've got something really beautiful here. That soil is sweet. It's beautiful what you can do. But what I then have to do, I can't just talk this evangelical style talk sure. to them. I've, got to, I've also got to bring uh, to the table, I can show you how to make a living out of this. Yeah, wow. I can show you how to make a living out of the sweetness of your soil. Yeah. It's not just me coming and talking about, oh, how lucky you are, you've got this, but yeah. you're going to go and live in a dirt hut and you can't send your kids to school and you can, you know, you can barely find enough money to buy clothes. You, th 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 that's not and by the way, don't don't be using the chemicals when they come around offering. Yeah, them. yeah, and they do. They come around and to get everyone hooked to it. They come around and offer them for free in wow. the beginning. It's like a drug. Yeah. Actually, the chemicalization of farms it kind of is a drug. Is you, you, the parallel is the drug trade. Yeah. I mean, you just go into a community, you make the drugs available extremely cheap, or if not free, get whole pockets of of that community interested, hooked, involved then the price goes up and that's that's how um, uh, the chemical industry uh, works with farmers in the third world Jeez. what we do is we go in and say to the farmers you've got something far sweeter and that will make you more money than following this path we lose farmers we lose farmers all the time that go down the chemical path because the chemical evangelists come in and say here's bags of these chemicals we're going to give them to you for free you will increase your 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 mango output by 50 percent if you use if you spray this on your trees hmm. it's true they will sounds good they will for two three four five years and then they've got to buy more chemicals because it's not working as well and, and within five years, they have to buy so, they're so hooked to this dependence on these, uh, on a range of chemicals to fix the damage that this chemical did. Yeah. And then you need to get this chemical to fix yeah. this chemical that was fixing this chemical. And so this, this dependency on the chemicalization of farming is you are completely hooked. Yeah. You can't redeem your soil without leaving it for 20 years. You are now completely involved in this drug this chemical wow. drug and and uh, you end up making less and less and less money and the chemical companies end up making more and more they're not stupid they design it to be like this wow. they design it so that you're going to make a little bit of money at the beginning and then by uh, as time goes by you're having to spend so much money on acquiring those chemicals to fix the original problems 
that you end up you're going to end up making, not making money anymore. So what we do is we go in and say, please don't turn to the dark side. Yes. Uh, please, th there is a force in your soil. Yeah. There's an energy in your soil. What we, what our job is, our job is to show you how you can make that force work for you. Yeah. Wow. And because the, these guys are a lot of them and women, they a lot of them are uneducated. They, they're not able to find those markets. Mm. And. They, they, they often don't have the capital to, to take the time out to seek the markets. Sure, got to keep working. Yeah. So th they do need support. They do need help. Mm. And that's what we do. We, we show them the markets and we show them how to maintain those markets, how to win the markets. Right on. And, and it, you know, it's a beautiful thing when you see a farmer who lived in a, in a, in a bamboo hut build a house yeah, and, wow. and buy a motorbike. It's a wonderful thing to see. Yeah. And my motivation is about getting that farmer to have a relationship with the, the earth god. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Do you have any idea, as a percentage-wise, off the top of your head, what kind of, I mean, just even here on Bali, what kind of a percentage is chemicalized and, and poison and toxic and doing that, and what kind of a percentage is still pristine? I, could, I, I couldn't give could you, you figures. Guess? No, that's, you, that's could, you could play with numbers. You could play with numbers. You could, you could say probably it's 90-10. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a 90% um, chemicalized, 10% wow. not. And which way is it trending? Dare I ask, at 90% already. Oh, um, my God. No, I think it's peaked. I think it's starting to come back. Okay. Because of the demand for, for organic. Yeah, right. It, it's, starting, it, it, it's starting to come back. But at the moment, unfortunately, uh, uh, it's mostly people pretending it's organic. Well, because, I mean, I can go down to here to a bud, and there's tons of restaurants and cafes, it's all organic on the menu and no. all this kind of stuff. But if it's only 10% of the land area, yeah. are they importing all the organic stuff? Like, what's no. going on there? No, it's just the game that's being played. We're in that transition stage. Well, uh, uh, it's creative writing. I mean, creative, organic's creative. organic, right? Surely you can't be using chemicals on a yes, on an organic farm. Yes, but there can be there can be. Uh, 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 well, it's just really difficult to say. Yeah, I'll put you um, right on the spot here, haven't yeah, I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there can be. Uh, look, look. Okay, I'm going to say it like this: Re what I call retailers of food. Farmers are not generally retailers of food; sure. they're producers. Yep. I'm in that area. I've had offers to be part of retailing in food. I, 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 I had the opportunity to be a part of Lockervoir and I decided I'm not a food retailer. I regret it now because Lockervoir is just the you know, third, third best restaurant in Asia. And, sure. and, you know, but but um, it, it, it comes down to uh, basically uh, the food retailers realizing that there aren't rules in place, there are no investigators in place who are observing where they are actually sourcing their products. So uh, a, reta a food retailer, which is a restaurant, which is a cafe, which sure. is you know, a yep. resort, um, can pretty much buy their products from anywhere they choose and then relabel. Most of them don't do that. Most of them prefer if the, the supplier they buy it from do the cheating. Oh my God. And so they're aware that there's a game being played, but they all get to be able to say, oh, I don't know that our producer, our, producer, our supplier says it's organic, so it's organic. Not enough people. There's no universities out there training people on how to spot the differences. There are physical differences. Uh, one of the reasons meat is really good to work with from an organic point of view is it's very hard to scam someone because the meat is completely different, mm. looks different. Uh, veggies, is, it's a lot more difficult. Um, I, I've been disillusioned more than once when I've, I'm lucky in that I have a, 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 the skills to be able to go to a farm, measure what they're doing on the farm, measure the results, uh, look at their numbers and know whether 
the stuff they're selling is what I'm seeing in front of me. Mm. Or if it's coming from, uh, for example, I, I will give you an example without mentioning names. Sure. I know of one big supplier who has five hectares of land, mm -hmm. but supplies about 5,000 hectares worth of veggies. Mm -hmm. So there's a number imbalance there. Gotcha. So I'll leave it to the audience yeah, to work gotcha. out what that imbalance is. Yeah. And, and this problem is, is pretty much um, everywhere. Mm. It's a lot more difficult in Western countries because of the government regulations and, and, and inspections. Mm -hmm. It's more difficult. It, the game can still be played, but if you're anywhere in the third world, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's open season on game playing. Wow. So at the end of the day, it's about, you've got to, I mean, this is not really possible for people who are not uh, um, living rurally or who, who are living in cities, but it, it's really helpful if you get to know your um, um, supplier, your producer. And there are other ways. I think there are starting to be more and more organizations evolving, forming, uh, who, who are actually... Um, uh, going to do the investigations okay who are going to be looking for people yeah and letting people know uh, whether it's legitimate or not yeah right um, so what is organic and what isn't what's being yeah done with well, chemicals, well, how reliable being... you can find you th these people are mm. I mean I, I, I've never known anyone that I know who's a who's a environmental warrior anyone that's um, uh, committed to the earth as, as God, as, as, as the, the essence of who we are. I've never really known those sorts of believers to cut corners because they, they, they're rooted in a philosophy yeah, sure. of love for the planet. Yeah. It, it, often uh, what happens is in a transition phase into organics, people that first step into it, step into it because there's money there. Yeah, sure. What people don't understand is uh, people often say to me, and this is something that a question might be raised about, why is organic always more expensive? Why is it so expensive? Well, you can ask that question. And, and th there's a very easy answer. Uh, once you start negotiating with nature again, yep. there's a nature tax. Nature's going to hit you with things. For example, I've, I've worked with, say, 120 chickens, uh, guided them into adulthood where they're getting to the point where we're going to be able to cull them. And, and get our money back. And we've lost 84, 83, 84 Whoa. out of the 120. And that would kill off most poor farmers. If you don't have uh, like a financial fallback, then you're in deep, deep trouble. Sure. Um, uh, now, what you're left when, when, say, the virus or the flu that's killing your birds, you have to make a decision about going into antibiotic in your birds, which means you can't then sell them as organic. Yep. There's a couple of decisions I then have to make as a mm. farmer. I've got to go, well, I'm going to antibiotic them and then just not tell anyone. So in a sense, I'm betraying my customers. And that's something I won't do mm. because my customers have the same philosophy that I have. And I can't betray them on that philosophy. Mm. So I would rather lose the 84 and just hope it, we get some chickens left over that I can eat at the end of it. Um, but. If you're living on the edge and you're trying to make a living out of this, that decision of whether temptation. you chemi chemicalize or not, it's a massive temptation. Mm. And we get our farmers, we alleviate them out of it by me promising all of them. I, I basically replace all their losses. Wow. So none of the farmers in our cooperative ever have to worry. I could tell you long stories of how wow. that evolved, how that idea evolved, but that's the way I guarantee that, that when we do have those sorts of losses, uh, we also try to factor in the losses to the price. Gotcha. So if we to. don't do that, if we don't factor losses, we, we know we're going to lose 20% anyway at standard. Mm. Sometimes we have a great season, we'll only lose 10%. Sometimes we have a nightmare season when we lose 80 Mm. So in say here, a season could be in the dry season where we're usually down around eight or less. In the wet season, we could be bouncing from 40 to 80 percent losses. Wow. So we know in the wet season we're not going to make money. 
Mm. So we make our money in the dry season. We keep our price at a price that allows us to build up some fat. Mm. And so that when that wet season hits us, we could have, we could have hundreds of orders, but we can only supply 20 because mm. we just don't have the birds. Most of them are dead. Mm. And so our sales are down. The chickens are smaller, scrawnier, skinnier. Um, so we don't get the money back in terms of the weight. And so it's tap into that fat that we built up mm. over the dry. And so we have to teach farmers how to do this, how to farm like this, mm. to not expect to win all the time. When you have a relationship with nature, nature's the boss. Mm. And it, like in Australia, nature can break you. I mean, you have a 10 year drought. Yeah. And, and yep. you've had to kill all, all your stock or you can't grow anything. You, it's hard to love nature still. But this is why the philosophy becomes important that you, when you recognize that that structure existed a billion years before you came onto the scene as a farmer, and that structure you have to admire and respect mm. and love because that's the heartbeat of this planet and this planet is deciding what will happen so you have to just let go of those things so yeah it makes farming an extraordinarily difficult job it makes those farmers who choose to turn their back on chemicalization people that you absolutely have to have total admiration for mm. because to support you getting clean food mm. and to support the planet's health they're suffering losses constantly mm. and that's why the price is here mm. and that's why you pay that price with a smile yeah because you know that price is protecting this world I, wow. I could almost tear up with the thought of that 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 price you're paying is protecting this world mm. where this all falls apart and where this all hurts is when you get farmers who don't have that relationship who don't care, who will chemicalize, but will then talk the organic talk, the organic philosophy, and get the organic price that I sweated blood and stress to achieve. They're now coming in, oh, that's the organic, oh, I'm going to sell just under that so everyone buys my product. I can't, I can't lower my price. I can't play with it because this is my survival price. If I start playing with what this guy's doing, I can't be organic anymore. And so it, it's, 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 almost, it's a criminal act mm. to, to be pretending to be organic and take those organic prices. Mm. And look, mostly the people that are doing it are the middlemen. It's not actually the farmers themselves. Sure. Sometimes it is, but mostly it's middlemen. So by the time they're buying the, the veggies from wherever, or the chicken from wherever and then bringing it and by the time it's gone from the farm to the marketplace it's it's fully pastured organic blah 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 um, they're they're uh, I, I don't have ugly enough words to describe what they're doing they're betraying the customers and they're betraying the planet mm. step out and you know what how do you fix that how do we fix that well Fixing it, to me, gets us out of the first transitional stage of organic. I see organics as a three-stage process. Okay. First stage is, don't give a shit about it at all anyway. Yep. And that's how our grandfathers were, and for some of us, our parents were, because they grew up in a chemical era of humans winning all the time. Yeah. I can produce 10 times more corn than ever before, and we're winning, yep. we're winning. And that whole generation, what true belief, and that's the age of McDonald's taking over, that's the age of KFC, that's the age of factory farming, that's the yep. age of, of buying all your food in little plastic packages, t totally packaged foods uh, in, in supermarket aisles. Microwave that, dinners. That, yeah, and that's the age canned, of that. Yep. That age is over. That, we're now looking back on that and trying to cut the last uh, tentacles yeah. that, are, that are clinging us to that era. We're yep. trying to remove ourselves from that. Oh, the three. So that's the first so one. So that's the first stage. You really, so our grandparents and that, that from say the 40, the 30s onwards, yep. they're locked into that. We're now in the second stage, which is we know it's not working. Yeah. And we know the damage it's doing. Yep. And we want to do something about it. So we're kind of trying. At least the tip of the iceberg yeah. of the damage, yeah. damage so, is doing. So right? we know we've got this disease yep. and the disease is killing us. 
we, we don't know where to go, what to do, we haven't heard. And then the guy in this little wagon with all these beautiful signs on the side of the wagon comes out. He's got a big moustache, not unlike mine. <laughs> and, he, and, and, and he pulls up his little hat and says, I've got the snake oil for you. And there, that's what I call second stage organics. It's not really organic. It's not really going to heal you, cure you. It's not going to do anything for the planet because it's not actually organic. It's got all the words. It's got all the sounds. All it's the got promises. all the talk and all the promises of organic. But none of the deep-seated changes have actually occurred. Huh. That's where that's the stage we're in. Gotcha. Now, there are people in this second stage already evolving and we're growing all the time. I'm teaching farmers all the time to be joining this group and there's people like me and uh, dozens of people like me in every country doing the same thing who are actually walking a walk we're in that second stage where we're small in numbers we're being pretty much squeezed under by the people hunting the money where's the money where's the price um, and they're, f they're not walking the walk behind the mm. scenes that's where we're at what we all need to be in is in that third stage where everybody that works with organics, everybody that works with, with pasture, um, that works with nature-based foods are really walking it. Mm. We're in so many ways we're not yet there yet, but we're well on our way. Nice. Um, there's a few projects that I know about that are going to take massive steps towards a worldwide revolution in in supporting the real organics. Wow. Um, so obviously there's changes coming, yep. and social media is gonna help those changes come. You will hear word of mouth from people. It, it, it's pretty hard, if you're a snake oil guy, to to last a long time, to, to maintain someone yourself. Someone finds out, everybody it, knows. It's a short-term deal. Gotcha. Once you've lost your, your reputation, your wagon turns up in some uh, you know, uh, town somewhere, you're going to be run out of town. So it, it, it's a short, but it is, it, at the stage we're in now, it's dominant. Gotcha. And there's people making a lot of money out of being fake. Mm. Um, but it's changing. Nice. I, I can see the tides moving on this. So, yeah. And you, I mean, you mentioned to me before that you can actually tell, especially when you look at meat, when you look at eggs, mm. and to a lesser extent when you look at produce. And you can compare and you can go, well, this is clearly not organic, and maybe this is, maybe this isn't, but this is clearly not, right? That's a great question, Patrick, because it, it I mean, it, you're basically sh highlighting that education about organics is, is the answer. Mm. Why don't we have children who could walk onto a farm and do the same assessments that I do? They're real, real, real knowledge. Yeah. Really knowing what you're looking at, mm -hmm. working with plants, and t being able to look at a tree and know whether that tree's being treated well, mm. and that tree's producing from its own heart rather than what you're squeezing out of it with with chemicals. Wow. Um, you, you can tell, and it's mm -hmm. about educating people on how to tell, what to look for, um, how to listen when people talk about what they're doing with their products. I mean, I see people buying uh, 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 triple distilled, quadrupled organic, free range, pastured, organically siphoned hair shampoo. <laughs> yep. And they will spend a dozen dollars more money for that. And they're just basing everything on the writing. And it's something that they scratch their hair with. But the stuff going down into the soul, into the center of their being. Into the temple. Into the temple. They're not taking any concern with it at all. I mean, and it doesn't matter if you're vegetarian, vegan, or omnivore. You're still, if you're putting chemicalized veggies in your system, there's still chemicalized veggies. If you're putting chemicalized meat into your system, there's still chemicalized meat. Mm. Um, there's so, we're, we're, we're we're kind of like a little bit misplaced in terms of priority. The priority should absolutely be the food going into the temple. Mm. The other things are important, because, and even if they're fake, it's still spend your money there because it's part of that second stage sure. journey of, the right getting, of getting to that third stage. Yeah. 
you, you can't, I mean, I will still buy the shampoo that's saying all that you butte stuff, whether they, they're doing it or not, mostly because I know I'm in second stage. The time will come when there will be agencies that I could just quickly check and find out whether they're really walking the walk yeah, or not. Wow. That time is coming. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Wow. Anything else you'd love to share before we wrap up? I've started a movement. I haven't done anything with it yet. Um, I've just gathered a couple of people. We started developing this concept. I've been developing this concept actually for two years. Okay. And it's come from, I'm in this really unusual position of, of being a backdoor farm supplier and being an eater in the front door. So I go to these restaurants, I eat, I eat at Block of Ore, I eat at, at top restaurants. Yep. But I also am in the unusual position of observing what they're doing, whether they're real or not. Sure. And I can tell you that there are a handful of restaurants that are real. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are fake. Mm -hmm. Um, I could tell you some extreme examples. Um, I Probably know of best. one place that is supposed, supposedly one of the very spiritual uh, restaurants. Um, they buy a small number of chickens from us each year, or every two years actually. And they keep them in the freezer and if they ever get questioned about the chicken they're serving their customers, they pull out our chickens, hmm. show them to the customer and put them back in the freezer. But they're not using our chickens in their, in their menus. They're using factory farm chickens. Abuse, abusive, chemicalized, zombie aberrations um, to feed the customers. Hmm. So that for me, they're fully, full participants in a scam. Hmm. And a scam without any level of integrity whatsoever. For me, hmm. Uh, it's not a great option, but it would be much better that they serve factory farm zombies and do it openly and honestly than to be trying to scam their customers. Mm. To me, there's something completely unethical about what they're doing. Sure. And I even, it hurts me to sell them those five chickens every two years because mm. I know how they're going to be used. It mm. hurts me. But I, it's not my job to go in and tell people how to run their business. But I've experienced this sort of thing on so many occasions and at so many levels, like sometimes quite graphic levels, where I, I've, I've had a, a meeting with, um, a, a lot of it happens to be Westerners who own these restaurants. And they know that customers want organic produce. Sure. But their profit levels are so high much higher than their profit levels would be if they had a restaurant in Australia mm. or in the US or Europe, much higher because their, their, their basic uh, costs here are so low. But they, you know, for example, our, our, uh, a chicken will sell for uh, the same uh, price as a factory farm chicken in Australia, yet a restaurant in Australia will, will offer an organic chicken, which is twice as inexpensive as an organic chicken here. Um, but here their wage, their wage, the wages are so low, the cost of everything is so low, but the price of the dish you're eating is the same price that you'll pay. Yeah. And you're eating factory farm garbage here. It's costing them next to nothing. Wow. So the profit levels here are pretty intense, mm. pretty huge. You've seen. Um, yeah. The commitment to the real deal is not there. Hmm. Um, there are, the other thing we often have is we often have a lot of chefs that will buy specifically from us for their home, but not for their restaurant. Wow. Um, they've been our main customer for, for uh, our main customer base all these years has often been chefs. Um, so they want the best for themselves and mm, their family and their mm, homes. And they want profit. And they want profit from, from their the business. Mm. That's, what, that's one of the wake-up calls people have to do about what restaurants are. Restra restaurants are not just suppliers of food. Mm. Restaurants are money-making machines. Yeah, businesses for profit. Yeah, they don't exist if they don't make it. Mm, but, of course. 
but uh, I mean, look, I, I remember I had a meeting one time with uh, one woman who owned several restaurants. Who, when we first had the meeting, I remember she was on the phone discussing with one of her friends where they're going to go sailing, which, which villages they're going to visit on their next sailing trip. Um, uh, and I looked at a menu, there was nothing organic on the menu, there was a lot of talk about farm produce and farm food, um, and then we had this meeting where we talked about um, what we do and everything else, and she showed me how she was uh, one of these true believers, so she, because I, 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 I don't want to work with people. I interview chefs and I interview restaurants as much as they interview me. Sure. And I won't work with people that don't project the same philosophy that we carry. Nice. Um, because how can I talk about people changing if I'm not insisting on working and supporting people as well? So we've knocked back a lot of buyers because they just don't exhibit, they're doing it for marketing reasons rather than a real belief. Mm. So I was interviewing, she, she gave me the full walking the walk and I've wanted to do this for years, I felt guilty that I'm not organic and, and, and I listened to all of that it was really wonderful and then Lovely. Uh, towards the end of the discussion she said let's have a look at your prices. So I handed her our price sheet, there was this moment of silence while she read through it and I kid you not, there was not even a moment's hesitation. She looked at me and she said actually I meant to tell you earlier the farmers that supply us now are mostly organic already. It was almost a Monty Python scene. It, it was just such chalk, a moment of such extreme variation in perspective. And I looked at her and I said, really? And, and she said, yes, I, my suppliers now are already um, farming organically. And, and I said, have you been to their farms? She said, no, but I know they are. And I said, well, why am I here? She said, yeah, I don't know. And that was the end of that interview. Wow. Well, she's buying so much cheaper and not organic. And selling at prices that are Australian prices. Yeah. If she operated a restaurant like that in Australia, it would have to be organic. Mm. She gets to pretend here. Mm. So John, thank you so much for sharing. I mean, I'm so <laughs> blown away again and so grateful that we could take the time to, to really you know, hear your story. And what's come through for me is this, you know, as it did last time, this deep commitment to earth, to nature, to trusting in that, you know, this ancient process that's created all the diversity of life that we have here, even when it may not be convenient for us or profitable for us, but to say, well, this is what's required. This is the wisdom that we have that has got us here and this is the wisdom that will ensure that as an ecology this whole system can continue to thrive for a long time to come well into the future and what we're doing right now may seem short term more convenient short term more profitable and absolutely you know the writings on the wall right it's not going to mm. last another hundred years let alone mm. thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years there's no way mm. and what I love is that you've got real practical steps that you're taking right now and you're doing what what you can do and what anybody could really do I mean you've got some amazing skills and some some stuff and I hope you're gonna produce that that series where we can talk about I just had another thought all right <laughs> can I divert <laughs> yeah of course um, actually what you just talked about then reminded me we started a project with fishermen as well a, okay. similar, a similar project uh, where uh, because I went through a period where I, I don't eat prawns anymore, and I, I love um, eating prawns. Okay. And I won't do it because uh, the, the farm prawns are extremely unhealthy, and they're also unhealthy for the environment. So that leaves me with wild harvested prawns. I, I was doing some reading about that, and when I found out that uh, there are factory ships out there where 90% of their prawn catch is not prawns, and the bycatch, which is 90%, gets dumped back into the ocean. Oh my God. And when you've got ships that, that, that basically sway fish, uh, like they've got nets that will be fishing like a kilometre either side of the ship, and then you've got 10 ships in a, in a line, 
and you've got uh, you've got thousands of kilometres of ocean that are just being swept of all life, and then we take 10% of the catch to keep that to sell at a premium price, and the rest of the catch, which is dead now, gets dumped back into the ocean. Oh my God! When I when I read about that, I realised that's the end of that's the end of um, prawns, prawns for, me. for me. So this wasn't even about uh, plastic or mercury. No, this is no, it was just our just practices, our farming, our seafood farming practices. Horrific loss of life. Yeah. And, Totally irresponsible practices. Uh, I, I stopped eating prawns and I still fantasize about eating prawns. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've it's just. A thousand I've, dollars sauce yeah, and some I avocado. Just, and I just went, but so uh, what that then triggered me to do is it triggered me look, I, I'm gonna, uh, I still eat seafood, I love seafood. Um, a lot of the seafood comes to us here formaldehyde, uh, that's to preserve the fish out to sea. Um, so we started choosing farm, uh, fishermen who were poor, who we paid out their credit, and then they started working for us, but they had to follow the rules. It all had to be handline caught. It all had to be handled professionally from the moment it was caught. And so when you're handline catching fish, it's sustainable. It's yeah. not these giant factory ships catching billions of tons every hour. It's just like... It, it, it reduces the amount of fish. It, it's about catching fish that are that are in numbers to be caught, yep. um, and that's the way fishing should be. Fishing mm. get rid of ban it all factory style fishing, mm. um, and it should all be hand line caught by men in, in fishing boats or yep. women in fishing boats. Um, and so we started uh, planning that a year ago, and it started a few months ago where we just um, sponsor. Uh, fishermen oh, cool. to handline catch and the fish uh, now comes uh, here to Ubud same we call it same day fish wow so fish caught in the morning yep and so what we're doing is we're teaching the the, the fishermen how to be ecological how to be environmental environmental and how to be sustainable so that they have a premium product which is fish they yeah. catch that morning and then make it available to sell that day so it's you get to eat fish mm. caught that day yep uh, and that's hard to find wow. anywhere, even on an island like Bali, it's very hard to find fish that were caught that day. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, going down these sorts of paths, these sorts of directions, you, you can often see things where you can support and sponsor mm. foods to be better, to be more sustainable, less mm. damage to the environment. I'm constantly looking that anything I buy, anything I do, I'm constantly looking to support the people mm. who are making commitments to to this earth. Doing it right. Yeah. Right on. You're an inspiration, John, and, and a massive challenge, and a massive inspiration. Well, you Beautiful. have to be an inspiration. It's not about me being. Uh, look, I'm just a speaking mouth. It's about <laughs> every single person being an inspiration yeah. to the planet, because the planet's looking on. One way or another, this world's going to move on with or without humans. Sure. And it will be damaged and changed by what humans have done. But the planet is watching us. And it's in our hands mm. what the next steps are. Mm. So we need to be an inspiration for the planet. We need to be an inspiration for other people that are walking this walk. Because it's not easy. It's not easy making these sorts of decisions. Mm. You know, it's not easy eating a little bit less, but eating what you philosophically believe in. Mm. It's not easy. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a commitment from the heart. Mm. But it works. It does right make on. changes. Right on. Let's do that. I'm up for it. So I would love for, um, to hear from you down the track if you would make some videos talking about how I know if this egg is organic or not, or how I know if this meat is organic or not, or how to... What to look for, the what signs. What to look for, people yeah, can the then, signs. What, what will happen is people then will be busy. Because you can see it, right? Yeah, you I can. I can't see it. I look can. at it and I have no idea. Yeah. But can you can you teach that? Yeah, you can. All right. Would you do that? Yeah. Right on. Yeah, right it's, on. It's, well, let's get I, those... I, I think it's important. Let's get that education. Let's get that information to the people who care and who want to do something and who like me, I just don't know what to do right now because we just have to trust the labels, trust the packaging. Yeah. But if I can look and I can tell, right on. Uh, and there are things that people really want to know. Yeah, yeah. totally. And I it, want it's, to know. It's, it's awesome because it also makes it harder for all the liars and cheats. Yes, exactly. To get by. Because exactly. Because people know what they're... But I'll give you an example. That one of the biggest sellers here of organic veggies, when I came up to her stall and I said, uh, 
actually, for a lot of the things, my, my mate had a had a spud farm, an organic, yeah. fully certified organic spud farm. So I've picked, I don't know how many millions and billions of yeah, wow. spuds over the years. But but I just picked them up and I sn sniffing them like this and putting them down. And then I looked and said, organic? And she got, because she knows I have a, a background <laughs> in farming, she got really, really nervous and she went, no, it's not. And I went, oh. actually, I didn't know. I just played the game like I, you could tell by sniffing it. I put it back and I kept going like this. And then there's about four veggies. And those four veggies, sh they're the litmus test. They absolutely have to be organic because yeah. they grow like weeds. Gotcha. So if you're spraying those, if you're, if you're chemicalizing those, then you're yeah. a complete idiot. Yeah, yeah. They don't need it. So then she would go, oh, no, that's organic, that's organic. So and then I went and sat like, I don't know, five metres away and then spent the next couple of hours just sort of sitting there drinking and eating and I was listening to what would happen when other customers came to her store. Yep. And when people say, is this organic? Yes, it's all organic. Wow. So wow. this is, is a game being played mm. and, and it's a game that's based on income mm. and money. But do you know why it upsets me? It upsets me because two times now in the last six years, I've had both of them were old Balinese men mm -hmm. who had decided they wanted to go into organics. So cool. they converted their land into doing organic veggies. Mm -hmm. They went into the markets in Ubud for like a month, set up their stall next to the, the real organic stall okay. with their big heads of cabbage and their capsicums perfect and all their... And they had their floppy their floppy um, insect infested broccoli heads yeah. which were this big compared to this big and their prices this guy because he's a middleman buyer none of it's organic yeah he has price flexibility now so he can drop his price beneath this old guy oh, man. and the old guy told both of them told me they done one had done it for six weeks one had done it for a month they hadn't sold a single vegetable wow but they were real one of them was had tears I can't say he was crying he wasn't making a noise he had tears running down his cheeks because he said, I've tried and I've failed. And the way he looked at it was, I'm not a good enough farmer. Wow. Because I look at what this man can grow. And I can't and do I that. And I can't do that. And he deserves, it was beautiful. This man was so beautiful, his attitude. He said, I don't deserve to be selling there because he is the man who can create. This. But what he doesn't understand is that this guy is a bullshit artist. Yeah. That's the tragedy. And the reason this then upsets me is, to me, the revolution in organics is about protecting this soil, this earth, yeah. this, this beautiful living thing. Yeah. That's why we do it. And so this is the guy, this old guy is the one I want to support, yeah. not this guy who's full yep. of shit. Yep. And so the, the status of things at the moment is it, these people are actually stopping the real deal mm. from coming through. Mm. And that's why it upset. I'm mm. happy that they keep doing what they're doing. I don't give a shit. Mm. I don't buy from them. Sure. But w where it does upset me is that when they get market share and if more customers come, they just go and buy more veggies from Java. They don't know where it's coming from. Yeah, of course. And they just extend their market share. And no, no one who's really trying to work with the earth gets to step in. Mm. Before we wrap up, anything else, any other stories, anything else that's occurred to you in the meantime that we want to have on the, on the interview? Just one last thing. I just love, love it if 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 um, more retailers went back to farmers because yeah, at the it. moment they're all controlled by suppliers, middlemen buyers. Got it. And and to teach chefs how to become seasonal again, how to work with farmers again. Mm. Chefs are extra have become extraordinarily lazy in the last sixty years because they're able to sort source their products from year round from yeah year round against the seasons against nature able to source it from any corner of the world factory produce industrial produce mm. whether it's vegetable or, or other whatever and and what i love to see is that the very very elite chefs today are rebuilding relationships with with Farmers, producers, farmer, farmer producers, farmer producers, and season, I love in that. season, and that's, local, organic. Yeah, yeah. and they're the doing way. it because awesome. customers are demanding There's it. There's a market for it. And and what we're involved often with is having to teach. Like I had to berate, not berate, <laughs> I had to remind a uh, particularly important chef that we work with, who's wonderful, creative, genius. 
who forgot for a moment who we are and how we can supply and what we can supply. Mm. And I felt treated this a little bit arrogantly with an order and, and, and we couldn't achieve it. And um, I had to remind him, we are not an international food distributor. We are a farm cooperative. Mm. Please work with us, not against us. Mm. Not ask us to do things that are impossible. Mm. And he said, oh, oh, sorry, I forgot. Mm. But, but the, the, they have been chefs, cooks, and generally customers too, have been spoiled by this abusive system that's been in mm. place. Now that we're trying to get rid of the abusive system, we're having to go back to how we used to have to negotiate with nature. And please remember that farmers want to be representative, representatives of nature. Yeah. Work with them. Don't ask them to do things that you can't be done. Beautiful. And then get upset if, if they don't do the impossible. Thanks so much again for your time, John. I'm super grateful. Thank and, you, Patrick. Uh, really looking forward to what comes next, right, okay. in this in this chapter. Okay, thank you.